Hello there, you're watching Talking Europe on France 24 with me, Catherine Nicholson. And how many times have you heard me and other journalists say this? Great uncertainty is hanging over the Brexit process. Well, that is in fact truer than ever. After a week of extraordinary scenes in Westminster, Boris Johnson losing his first ever parliament vote since becoming PM. There have also been expulsions and defections from his party, calls for election and claims of bullying. <laughs> These are unprecedented times, uncharted waters. We're asking, what does the EU side make of it all? As well as looking at a couple of other pressing matters for the bloc, not least the change of government in Italy. My guest today is France's former Europe Minister, Nathalie Loiseau, now a member of the European Parliament for Emmanuel Macron's Renaissance list. Uh, Nathalie Loiseau, thanks for being our guest. Hello. Now, uh, I will, of course, start straight away with Brexit, that big news of uh, the last week or so, much more. Um, we've had... Uh, opposition MPs and some Conservative MPs backing legislation aimed at averting a no-deal Brexit. What's your reaction to that? Well, um, it's been two uh, hectic years. Um, first, I would like to react to uh, the decision to suspend, to prorogue the Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, when the slogan for Brexit was giving back control to Westminster, to try to silence a Parliament, being an MEP myself, uh, is obviously appealing. Uh, so I'm not surprised that there was a strong reaction uh, in the British Parliament. I'm not surprised that British MPs uh, are uh, adamantly against a New Deal because it, it added uh, more chaos to uh, this very bad decision of Brexit. I'm sorry to say that. I know it was a choice of the British people. I'm not sure that No Deal was the choice of the British people. And I'm not certain that even about the Leave vote, it was done in full information about the consequences. We are in the middle of a Brexit madness, and it's extremely sad. Well, at the time of recording this interview, the UK hasn't asked Brussels for an extension. No. That is the intention of opposition MPs. Yes. Uh, what kind of reaction do you think that request would get? First, it would have to come from the Prime Minister, who has repeatedly said that he was leaving, that the UK was leaving the European Union, do or die, on October 31st. So uh, it's hard to react to hypotheses. Uh, you know that the position of the European Union is that for an extension there has to be a good reason. Mm. Because we have been extremely respectful of uh, British domestic politics, Ex extremely patient about uh, the bumps on the road uh, of the British politics. Uh, but it's been two years that everything has been on the table on the condition of a withdrawal of the UK. We have not chosen the principle or the date for the Brexit. But there has to be something new if there has to be an extension. At the same time, there would be great economic uh, pain and difficulty in many, many parts of Europe if there were a no deal, particularly in France. Well, let us be clear, any kind of Brexit is bad, both for the UK and for the European Union. There is no win-win situation for any kind of Brexit. A no deal is bad, uh, it's even worse for the UK than the, for the European Union. A bad deal would be worse than a no deal for the European Union. So we are not happy to see it coming because at the moment where we are talking, the most probable outcome is a no deal. But we are prepared. When I was a minister in the French government, I did my best efforts to prepare my country for the scenario of a no deal, we are prepared. Mm. Uh, and the day after a no deal, let us be clear, everything will still be on the table. Financial settlement, situation of citizens on both sides of the channel, and the question of the Irish border. It will not have disappeared. Well, the European Commission has, uh, in the last few days, changed the rules for how emergency funds work that yes. are normally put aside for natural disasters, like yes. earthquakes. Uh -huh. uh, they're saying that those funds could be used in the event yeah, of an ideal sure. Brexit around the EU. Does that mean that you and others here in Brussels are actually expecting catastrophe? And, and what level? I mean, in the UK, people are worried about deaths from lack of medicine, for example. Is yeah. that a worry here? Uh, it's not comparable because... Um, when you are in the single market and when you look for uh, medicine, 
you have the opportunity to choose from different producers, from different companies. Uh, when you are uh, in the UK and there is a no deal and you import medicine from Europe, uh, you have to have an approval from uh, the UK and the risk of shortage is much bigger. Uh, but we need money because we had to build infrastructures for controls, uh, customs controls, mm -hmm. because we will have to impose tariffs, uh, sanitary controls, because uh, we are the border uh, between the UK and the European Union. Well, uh, considering all of that, uh it is the understanding of many people that uh, a strategy for Boris Johnson and his team has been, as Theresa May tried to do, to try and get some bilateral deals between the UK and France, the UK and the Netherlands, the UK and Germany. Um, with this threat of this quite mm. catastrophic situation, potentially, uh, is there not a greater chance of some kind of bilateral deals being struck? I think one in the UK should never underestimate the unity of the 27. Uh, the negotiator is Michel Barnier and no one else. Uh, the position of, uh, that we have is a mandate given by the council to Michel Barnier. It's a clear mandate, it's an open mandate. The Westall agreement that we agreed uh, upon with Theresa May was a compromise. We made concessions uh, so that we could reach a deal with uh, the British, British authorities. There is no situation in which there could be separate negotiations with separate member states of the European Union. Now, the eternal stumbling block, of course, has been the issue of the backstop right. uh, to prevent the return of a hard border between the UK, right. Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland, still in the EU. Uh, Boris Johnson's written to the Commission saying he wants to find an alternative to the backstop. Uh, we've been hearing in news reports that uh, the UK has not been putting one forward. Uh, have you seen evidence of an alternative plan from the UK? I've seen nothing. What I heard from Boris Johnson, I had heard it from David Davis or from Dominic Robb when they were in charge of Brexit, that one should be flexible and creative. And let's call the bluff. Uh, let the UK be uh, creative and flexible. But until now, we have seen nothing. Uh, and why? We didn't choose the backstop because we are in love with the backstop. We spent two years of hard work before we found the solution of the backstop because mm -hmm. it was the only possible solution before or unless we are not able to manage to uh, find a solution for the future relationship. By the end of the transition period. Yeah. Well, the EU has long insisted that the UK be the one to come up with some ideas sure. and a solution. Um, can't the EU put something forward? There's all those bright minds in 27 member states. Well, you know, uh, bright minds have been working and we found the backstop. Uh, if Boris Johnson has a magical one, let him show it right now. Uh, but it could very well be that there is nothing else that is feasible except the backstop. Well, actually, there are two possible backstops, as you know. The one that Theresa May chose, which was uh, involving uh, the UK as a whole, or the one that we f first put on the table which was involving only Northern Ireland. If Boris Johnson wants to go back to the first proposal we met, well, we could consider. Where Northern Ireland remains within, essentially, the single right. market and the customs union. That's a choice for the UK to make. Once again, the UK chose to leave. The UK has to decide how it leaves. And if there were to be a change of government or a drastic change of thinking, and perhaps this is magical thinking in itself, but a change of the UK's red lines, even after all this time of negotiation, extensions, etc., mm. is that something that the EU would be prepared to go along with? Or would you just simply say, look, enough is enough? No, we have always said that if red lines are changing regarding the future relationship, uh, we would be ready to uh, redraft the political declaration because the political declaration was adopted according to the red lines put forward by Theresa May. If they change, there is no reason for us to uh, refuse to work a little more about it. We have always said it.
Let's move on to some other European affairs, because there are, of course, other states yes. within the European Union. New government taking shape in Italy right, right now. Uh, the previous government, coalition between the far-right Lega and the uh, anti-establishment Five Star Movement, had quite a fractious relationship with the French government mm. and the European Commission. Do you foresee better relations with this new centre-left and anti-establishment coalition? No doubt. Um... Uh, I think that, first of all, the previous government could not deliver its promises to the Italian people. Uh, Italy uh, is in recession for several months. The debt is rising to uh, unprecedented highs uh, and nothing has been solved. Uh, today, there is a new government in Italy uh, because uh, political parties, the Five Stars Movement and the Democratic parties, decided to take their responsibilities. They might have fought against another in the past, but they realized that the danger of having far right going against the interests of Italy was so big that they should work together. And of course, it we welcome this It wasn't because they were afraid move. of Lega winning an election. Uh, but not only of Lega winning an election, not alone, but with other far right activists, but also of Liga destroying the assets of Italy. Italy being a founding member of the European Union. Italy depending so much for its economy, on its belonging to the Eurozone, on its uh, economic relations with the rest of the European Union. Uh, the danger was big for Italy and for the rest of the European Union. Mm. I think it shows that there is no automaticity in far right winning because they speak loud. They speak loud, but they might not be that strong in terms of being able to rule a country. Well, let's move on to uh, something both European and French. Uh, some of the big jobs uh, at the European Commission are up for grabs at the moment. There have been nominations from across all of the member states, and of course, France has put forward its nomination as well. Sylvie Goulard, we have her picture behind you, in fact, in the studio. Now, she's President Macron's choice for French yeah. Commissioner. It's causing some controversy. Before we talk about her, we'll run a little report to let our viewers know a bit more about who she is, and then we'll come back to our interview. Sylvie Goulard is a staunch supporter of Emmanuel Macron. The French president appointed her defense minister in June 2017, but a European Parliament investigation into fake jobs allegedly invented by her political party, Modem, saw her resign the post after barely a month. But Goulard bounced back, accepting the position of deputy governor of the Bank of France seven months later, a role which she still holds today. Goulard is also a committed Europhile. She began her career at the French Foreign Ministry as part of the team that worked on the reunification of Germany. In 2009, Goulard was elected to the European Parliament and served as an MEP for eight years. Multilingual, Goulard is fluent in English, German and Italian. Her background and experience prompted Macron to put forth Goulard's name as a candidate for European Commissioner. Despite the ongoing inquiry, Goulard is not under formal investigation. It's widely believed that President Macron would like her to succeed Pierre Moscovici, the current European Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs. Goulard will meet with Ursula von der Leyen, the new president of the European Commission, as well as members of parliament in the coming weeks. Okay, we heard in our report Nathalie Loiseau, Sylvie Goulard, uh, a long-time uh, diplomat, lots of foreign experience, uh, like yourself. Uh, I know that you've also known her as an MEP. Is she a good choice? It's a great pick. Uh, first, I have to say that I am extremely proud that President Macron was pushing for women. Mm -hmm. He supported Ursula von der Leyen for being the president of the commission. Uh, he put forward Christine Lagarde for being the head of the uh, central bank. And now he proposes uh, Sylvie Goulard, a great European, respected, well-known throughout Europe, in Germany, in Italy, in the European Parliament. Three women, uh, three excellent choices. Now, uh, we also heard in our report that there has been that uh, suspicion surrounding, uh, if not Sylvie Goulard personally, because she's been cleared by a parliamentary investigation, right. but her party and her time during as an MEP over these uh, alleged uh, fictional 
jobs of parliamentary assistance. The French press now, as well, in the last few days, is reporting on another uh, affair, uh, saying that Sylvie Goulard was paid more than €10,000 a month uh, for quite a long period by a pro-American think tank mm. while she was an MEP. Now, it's currently unclear why. Just first question, do you know what her activity was with that American think tank? I don't know. She will be uh, the one to talk about it maybe in the hearings she will have here in the European Parliament. Uh, I have to stress that it was legal and she never hid it to the European Parliament. She always explained what she was doing uh, in her statements. Uh, so she did nothing illegal. Whether I would do the same, uh, that's a question. Is it a wise choice given the current suspicion towards politicians, especially quite establishment figures? Well, first, I think there should be uh, a stop about these suspicions against politicians, about elected members, elected representatives. I mean, it's pure populism to bash elected uh, representatives all the time. Uh, uh, and we find it everywhere throughout Europe. You know that even in France, a number of us were threatened, a number of uh, officers uh, were targeted. Uh, we should stop this. Well, uh, just, well, second, yeah. she followed the rules. Uh, nothing in the rules told her not to do so. Nowadays, maybe there's uh, pressure uh, for more transparency, for uh, uh, more commitment mm -hmm. to uh, the mandate we are having. I have to say that on my list, Renaissance, all the members of the list, all the elected members now, committed themselves to focus on their responsibilities at the European Parliament and to have no extra job uh, which would not uh, focus mm -hmm. itself on general interests. Thank you so much, Nathalie Loiseau, our guest this week on Talking Europe. Thanks to you for watching. See you soon. Pakistan's intellectual capital, Lahore, is known as the Pearl of Punjab. But its image has been tarnished by terrorist attacks. During the 2016 Easter celebrations, a suicide bomber killed 75 people, including several children. Fanatics targeted not just Christians, but the entire Western-oriented part of Lahore society. The city is finally embracing life again, with modern infrastructure, preserving its heritage, and a cultural renaissance. Discover Lahore's vibrant energy in this episode of Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.